the friends and world outreach partners of the Jimmy Swaggart Ministries welcome you to today's telecast. Each week, this ministry takes the gospel of Jesus Christ to every continent on the globe, reaching out with a total thrust, touching lives with love, preaching God's eternal plan of salvation. Many people are attempting to add to the finished work of the cross of Jesus Christ. Today, from Kansas City, Missouri, Evangelist Jimmy Swaggart addresses this issue and proclaims the real message of the cross. So let's now join the thousands gathered in the Kemper Arena in Kansas City as our service begins. We can take the land, there's no doubt about it, that's what Joshua said, that's what Caleb said about 34, 500 years ago, and the promises still hold true today. Ladies and gentlemen, John Starnes. <laughs> Fly! 
<laughs> Hallelujah. There's a river of life flowing out from me. <laughs> Hallelujah. You may be seated if you can. Oh, praise God. Mm. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, Janet Paschal, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Yeah. 
What does the cross of Christ mean to you? Evangelist Jimmy Swaggart now examines the all-important message of the cross. Thank you, Janet. Praise God. Hallelujah. They shall be as white as snow. As he quotes from the writings of the Apostle Paul in Galatians, chapter 6, verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. And I want to use for a message or a subject tonight the message of the cross. The cross of Christ today is, first of all, a message of pardon. Now, I want that to sink in. Foremost and first of all, it is a message of pardon. That is the undergirding message of the Word of God. It runs like a red thread all the way from Genesis to Revelation. The story told us by the Bible is that man is a sinner. Man cannot save himself. Man is hopelessly and helplessly lost, deserving to go to hell unable to save himself and God sent his son to take man's place to die on a bloody cross and to pay the price with the shedding of his blood and all who receives that shed blood by faith will be eternally everlastingly saved now you say, well, that's, that could not be too controversial. One of the most powerful preachers in the world, were I to call his name, every one of you would know it, made this statement the other day. He said, over television, I take it back, he said it to a group that he was ministering to, a large group of ministers. He said, I don't think anything has been done in the name of Christ and under the banner of Christianity that has proven more destructive to human personality and hence counterproductive to the evangelism enterprise than the often crude, uncouth, and unchristian strategy of attempting to make people aware of their lost and sinful condition. Did you hear that? And he has one of the largest followings on nationwide television. Many Pentecostal pastors go and listen to his sermons in his seminars. What does the Word of God tell us? The Word of God tells us in Romans, in your Bible, chapter 5 and verse 9. But God, verse 8, commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You hear me? This subtle approach to demean the cross of Jesus Christ. It, we are told today if we preach on the cross, it is negative. So we are not to preach on the cross because if we do, it will be a negative message and we should not preach a negative message. Because the cross speaks of the shedding of blood, it speaks of pain, it speaks of suffering, it speaks of heartache, it speaks of death. So that doesn't fit in with the power of positive thinking, does it? That doesn't fit in with possibility thinking, does it? 
That doesn't fit in with name it and claim it, does it? That doesn't fit in with PMA, positive mental attitude, does it? I want to show you something that, that is shocking. Many, many churches, many preachers today, people do not know it, they are led as sheep to the slaughter. Much of what is being preached from behind pulpits and especially over nationwide television, especially in the Pentecostal and charismatic realm, is little more than sorcery. What do you mean, sorcery? It is passed off, as I've just said, as possibility thinking, positive thinking, positive confession, old-fashioned sorcery masquerading as the power of the Holy Spirit. In its most seductive form, Christianized sorcery is, is accepted as scientific. It's accepted as Christian. It hides its true identity behind the language of psychology. The writers of the New Testament came down hard on that which they call sorcery. And there are two Greek words that are used in which the King James gives the translations of sorcery. One of them is meguo. And it means an attempt to manipulate reality. You understand? The power of posture thinking, mind science, possibility thinking. You can use your mind and do anything. One of the most powerful, one of the most powerful Pentecostal preachers in the world says this, this power can be used by the Buddhists, by the Hindus, and by the Muslims, and by Holy Ghost filled Christians. And he even said the Holy Ghost told him. That's blasphemy. God's power cannot be used by the Hindus or the Buddhists or the Muslims or the spiritualists. God's power will only be manifested through the shed blood of Jesus Christ that was shed at Calvary's cross 2,000 years ago. God said, when you take fire, you take it from the holy altar. And if you don't take it from the holy altar, you will die. You can listen to it and not understand what you're hearing. It sounds great. The world's major preachers are preaching it. But it's a lie. It's sorcery. It bypasses the cross. The second word is pharmakia, which means a person who takes consciousness altering drugs in order to contact spirit beings to gain supernatural power. That's done with LSD, with other drugs. A man is trying to find a cheap substitute for the cross. A cheap substitute for the cross. This spurious, specious, specious gospel, which is another gospel, is trying to make man believe he's a little God, and he's getting better and better and better and better and better and better, and it uses all the Bible terminology to make it appear holy, when in reality, man is sick. Man is a sinner. Man is lost. Man deserves to go to hell. Man is rotten. 
Man is filthy. Man cannot save himself. And the only reason God takes one look at us is because of his love and his mercy. And the only thing that can cleanse us and save us is not possibility thinking or the power of positive confession or the power of positive thinking. But I say it to you, Kansas City, and I say it to the world. The only thing that can save us today is the power of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And that's the reason Paul said, I will glory in the cross. It's not only a message of pardon, but it is a message of peace. The cross is a message of peace. Turn to Ephesians. Chapter 2, starting with the 13th verse. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, and that's speaking of the Jews and the Gentiles. The wall of the Gentiles is no longer there. It's broken down. All may come and drink. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. And that he might right reconcile both under God in one body by the cross. Notice, by the cross having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. This sounds, this sounds very innocuous and very insignificant peace but this is the this is the heart's cry of the human race you see that that something in man wants to wants to calm the rage the torment that's in him so he drinks alcohol he takes drugs cocaine marijuana heroin he makes money. All of this trying to find a satisfaction, trying to find a peace. However, today, to assuage the guilt that's in man's heart, we're hearing the gospel of self-esteem, which is a spurious, false, satanic gospel. It sounds good and it's fooling millions. But it is demonic. This is what one preacher said. He said, self-esteem is the new reformation. We need a new reformation. He said, the church has erred for centuries, and this is a preacher that preaches every week over nationwide television in America. He said, the church has erred for centuries. Listen, he said, we've had a God-centered theology when what is needed is a man-centered theology. He said, we're not so bad. We're simply badly informed about how good we are. Guilt, he said, is a loss of self-esteem. He said guilt, before I finish that sentence, let me say this. Guilt is getting to be a bad word. Guilt is a God-given mechanism within your life that lets you know when things are going wrong. 
We try to assuage the guilt by taking drugs, by taking pills, by taking tablets, by having somebody talk us out of it. But when you commit adultery and you feel like a dog, you ought to feel like a dog. When you're puffing on your cigarettes and you're fussing at your kids because they smoke a joint and you're smelling up the place with your Chesterfields and your old goals, you ought to feel guilty because you are guilty. Man is guilty because man is guilty. Man is a sinner. Man has strayed from God. Man has drifted from God. Man is evil and wicked. And the heart of man is desperately wicked. There's none good, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And it's sickening, putrid, pukish, pulp called the gospel of self-esteem is a lie. He said all of the problems facing... I don't want to finish that for the moment because I feel four or five of you are saying, you just don't have to be so blunt about it, Jimmy Swagger. ought to be more diplomatic. I want to tell you, I'm so sick of pussy-footing, tiny Tim, tiptoeing through the tulips preachers that are afraid to say what the Word of God says. God, give us men with backbones. Give us preachers that'll walk out and say, Thus saith the Lord, that'll call sin, sin, hell, hell, and heaven, heaven. souls and knowing the terror of God I persuade men one day I will have to stand before the God of all the ages and he will call my name and men like Paul and Peter will step up and my heavenly father I couldn't hold their sandals on their feet and I will have to answer for those television cameras and the millions upon millions and millions upon millions. And God forbid that one soul clutch at my coattail and say, you didn't tell me. You didn't tell me. This is the most dangerous hour the church has ever known. This is the most dangerous hour the Pentecostal church has ever known. This is the most dangerous hour. I sat with the greatest leaders in Pentecost the other day. No, they're not names you would know. And tears filled our eyes and we sat there. You know them, you know them. And wept and pleaded, what are we going to do? To try to receive peace. He said, all the problems facing the church will be solved if we only will meet every person's deepest need, his hunger for self-esteem, self-worth, and personal dignity. All right. The church today has accepted a fake gospel. It is a religion. And when I say what it is, you're going to sit there and say, ah, I don't know what he's talking about. Or if you do know what I'm talking about, you won't like what I'm talking about. Because I'm not talking about the Baptists or the Catholics or the Methodists or the Episcopalian now. I'm talking about Pentecostals, Assembly of God, Church of God, Four Square, Pentecostal Holiness, Charismatics, Word of Faith, Independence. 
The great religion, the great gospel today to peace in the heart of man is the religion of psychology. And some ask, what is wrong with Christian psychology? In the first place, you might as well say Christian witchcraft. No, I'm not being melodramatic. Some of you say, well, I don't, man, I don't care anything about that stuff. I'm not interested in that. You'd better be because it's going to wreck and destroy the Pentecostal movements if we don't have a Holy Ghost revival. I know most of you don't understand it because it sounds good. Christianity and psychology are two opposed religious belief systems. And you cannot possibly merger the two. I don't care what kind, I'm not talking, there are many different kinds of psychology that are perfectly good and, and perfectly scientific and helpful. I'm talking about so-called psychological counseling or counseling psychology that is being used by all of our preachers today to try to solve the problems of man. You see, psychology claims to deal with a very area that the Bible say, says is its soul province, which gets into the spiritual dimension. It will tell you psychology, how to be happier, more fulfilled, a better integrated personality, but these are the things that the Bible says are the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and peace of God that passes all understanding. And Christians are turning to psychology for personal peace and personal fulfillment, and that's an impossibility. Listen to me now. One pastor's wife said just yesterday, and she was right as she spoke to me. She said, there are so many problems today in the church that the pastor doesn't know what to do with them. And she's right. And he, he shifts the responsibility to a Christian psychologist. I'm going to tell you now the answer to these problems. If our preachers would get back to preaching powerful Bible messages, <laughs> preach the Word, preach the Word, there is not a problem in the human spirit, in the human mind, and the human heart that this Bible doesn't hold an answer to. Preach the Word. <laughs> preach it with the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And it'll meet the need of those people and let the Holy Ghost deal with them and bring them to an altar and break up the fallow ground and most of your problems are solved. I stood before all of our professors in our college last Monday morning and all the student body and said that false gospel will not be taught in our Bible college. It will not be taught. We will teach the Word. There is a peace that passeth all understanding, and that peace doesn't come from Harvard or Yale or Fromm or Freud. It comes from the Lord Jesus Christ and the blood that was shed at Calvary. Now you see, I can mention, I can mention the self-esteem and the other, and I don't have much problem, but when I talk about psychology, all of our preacher boys in the Assembly of God and Church of God and Foursquare are coming out of our Bible colleges, they've been taught that damnable lie. And it's a muddy stream, and it has no answer. I've got to hurry. I want to tell you one other thing. It'll take me two minutes. Just two minutes. You old-fashioned Baptists will know what I'm talking about. You old-fashioned Methodists will know what I'm talking about. You old-fashioned Nazarenes will know what I'm talking about. You old-fashioned Pentecostals will know what I'm talking about. You new-fashioned Baptists won't know what I'm talking about. You new-fashioned Pentecostals won't know what I'm talking about. You won't have the slightest idea what I'm talking about. But I'm going to tell you. When I was a kid, 
going to a little small frame country church. We didn't have any carpet on the floor. We didn't have any chandeliers. We didn't have all of these things. You could have put our church on half of this platform. Most of you were saved in a church just like that. Most of you were saved in a church like that if you have any gray in your hair. Even those of you that use Grecian formula. The whole thing in our church services, I don't care what the evangelist preached or what the pastor preached, was for one purpose. It all led to the altar. Everything led to the altar. Everything led to the altar. We, when I was a boy, we'd go to the altar and get on our knees uh, and we'd cry to God. Uh, and finally the power would fall uh, and the glory would fall uh, and heaven would come down uh, and people would dance in the spirit uh, and some would shout uh, and some would cry uh, and some would walk uh, and some would dance. Uh, I'm telling you, that's the greatest psychiatry. That's the greatest psychology that the world has ever known. All right, one more, one more point, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop. It's not only the cross, it's not only a message of pardon, it's not only a message of peace, but it's a message of power. Hallelujah. Paul said, I didn't know anything among you except the cross. The cross. And I want to tell you something, and I want you to listen to me. There are 20 million alcoholics in America and only God knows how many in the other countries that this program goes into. America has, they tell us, ten million homosexual men in America. The guilt the guilt will destroy you. Now you can get angry at Jimmy Swaggart, but if you do, you're getting angry at one of the few in this world that really loves your soul. Really loves your soul. The great Paul, I believe he was writing to the church once again at Corinth, named a whole list of the most ribald, wicked sins, and among them was the sin of homosexuality. Then he said to the church at Corinth, but such were some of you, but ye are washed, ye are cleansed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified. Now. I'm going to tell you the only remedy for your bondage, and bondage is what it is. It's not an alternate lifestyle. This would go for the alcoholic. It goes for the child molester. It goes for the pervert. It goes for tobacco. It goes for drugs. It goes for hate. It goes for murder. It goes for greed, malice, concupiscence, lasciviousness. It goes for every bondage that hell can think. Listen to me. You can undergo all the therapy in the world and you won't have any victory. You won't make it. You can go to the psychologist, the psychiatrist, the therapist, the counselors, you won't make it. The only, the only power that can break that bondage and break it totally is for you to understand that 2,000 years ago when Jesus Christ hung on that bloody hill and the earth trembled and the skies turned black and he that knew no sin became sin that we may become the righteousness of God in him. 
And he said, it is finished. And if you will listen to me and come to the King of Kings and say, Master, forgive me, cleanse me, and wash me from my terrible sin. I deserve to go to hell, but have mercy on my soul. And I believe that when you died on Calvary, you broke the bondage of alcohol, of nicotine, of heroin, of cocaine, of marijuana, of speed, of LSD, of hate, of homosexuality, of greed, of bitterness. You broke it. And I claim that victory, that power. Instantly, the bond of sin will be broken. That is the only remedy. There is no other. On our daily telecast, which will come up in just a few weeks, in one week we had two men on that if ever proved a point, and it doesn't need proving, but it did prove it, and it's this. Most of you know Dave Reaver. with a phosphorus grenade in his hand in Vietnam, starting to throw it at an enemy pillbox. A bullet hit that grenade and it exploded inches from his face. It blew 60 pounds of flesh off of his body. He burned for weeks. I mean, the doctors would cut him open and he would burst into flame because of the phosphorus in his body. By all the psychological programming, Dave Reaver should be a drug addict or an alcoholic or commit suicide. But Dave Reaver is winning more souls to Jesus today. Because of the cross of Christ. He'll be on our program in a few days. The last two days, Dr. And was on. Born in Beirut, raised in Jerusalem. He said, Brother Swaggart, when we started to speak and talk about the Muslims, he said, I hated the Muslims. I hated them. Muslims shot my grandfather 25 times and killed him. They chopped off my grandmother's head with an axe. They killed 18 of my relatives. I hated them. Hate burned in my heart. But he said, when Jesus saved my soul, the hate left. The hate left. That's your only answer. That's the answer for the problems in the Middle East. That's the only answer. He said when he was seeking for the Holy Spirit, he said the hate left, but the love didn't come in when he got saved. And he was kneeling and saying, Jesus, baptize me in the Holy Spirit. And the Lord kept saying to him, Muslims, 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 Muslims. And when he said, Lord, I love the Muslims, he was instantly baptized in the Holy Ghost. Down at the cross, where my Savior died. Down where for cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Would you bow your heads, please? Father. In the name of Jesus, I pray that thy spirit would move unhindered, unchecked, all across this audience. I pray that every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl, and everyone that's watching by television, the millions upon millions upon millions, 
and our stumblings that somehow we have presented the cross the cross behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world I'm asking that Holy Ghost conviction would sweep sweep this audience your heads are bowed your eyes are closed your only hope tonight your only hope tonight is the cross of Christ I want everyone in this place to stand please everybody standing and I want to tell you this before I ask you to come if you are not under the protection of the blood you'd better run you'd better get here as quickly as you can it is the only safety teenagers come and come quick mom and dad come and come quick you'd better hurry there is no other safety there is no other shelter but the cross of Jesus Christ as they sing it I want you to come all over this place come on come on come on right now we'll wait for you I Just about to give her the greatest gift you can ever give her a Christian mother. Praise God. I'm coming home. I'm coming home. He loves you. He's waiting for you. Come from the top. We will wait for you. Heaven will wait for you. Jesus will wait for you. There is no other safety but the cross. I want you to look at Brother Swaggart, please. I want you but television to look at me, please, for a moment. This is the most beautiful moment of all, the most beautiful moment because of certain things, and the certain things are these. Number one, he loves every one of you. I mean, every one of you. Secondly, he doesn't see you as you are. He sees you as you will be. Hallelujah. Thirdly, thirdly, he knows. He knows the loneliness. He knows the heartache. He knows the hurt down inside. Now I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. You but television in your home, that motel room, wherever you may be, a visitor's, a guest, a friend's house. I want you to pray with me right now as well. I'm going to pray. I kind of know what you need to say because I've stood where you stand. And I want you to pray with me and believe it with all of your heart right now. Now let us pray. Donnie will help you. Dear God in heaven. Dear God in heaven. I come to you today. I come to you today. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. The Savior of the world. The Savior of the world. I'm tired of sin. I'm tired of sin. I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you. For your salvation. For your salvation. I am asking. I am asking. With your precious blood. With your precious blood. Cleanse me. Cleanse me. Wash me. Wash me. From all sin. From all sin. According to your holy word. According to your holy word. 
Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Verses 9 and 10. Verses 9 and 10. With my mouth. With my mouth. Before all of these people. Before all of these people. I confess the Lord Jesus. I confess the Lord Jesus. In my heart. In my heart. Right now. Right now. Forever and ever. Forever and ever. I believe. I believe. That God raised Jesus. That God raised Jesus. From the dead. From the dead. And he's alive. And he's alive. Lord. Lord. I'm coming home. I'm coming home. And I accept. And I accept. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. As my Savior. As my Savior. And according to his word. And according to his word. Right now. Right now. I'm his child. I'm his child. I'm cleansed. I'm cleansed. I am saved. I am saved. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Those of you by television, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I want you to write me. And I want to send you this book. You have seen me offer it half a hundred times. There's a new name written down in glory. And guess what? It's yours now. Postage paid, free of charge. We'll send it right to your door. We love you. We love you. And God loves you too. If your life has been changed by the message of the cross, we'd like to send you Brother Swaggart's booklet entitled, There's a New Name Written Down in Glory. Simply write to the address on the screen.
that covered the treasure he put there to pleasure his eyes. Yes, it does. We hope that you've enjoyed this message. For further information and to discover other sermons, visit us at ChristianSermonsOnline.com.